This is all about Bitcoin, a show dedicated to all things, questions and markets related to Bitcoin, little v for the currency and big Bitcoin, big V for the network. A collective journey to understand, apply and use this innovation, all Bitcoin, all the time. And I'm your host, Christine Lee. Let's have a live look at Bitcoin right now. The coin has Bitcoin price XBX index currently at $45,754. Bitcoin is trading slightly down about a one and a half percent over the past 24 hours. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as the leader in crypto news, events, and data. So let's take a look at some of our top stories of the day. U.S. House Representatives Patrick McHenry, McHenry and Glenn Thompson saying that rather than potentially regulating innovation and job creation out, of the United States, lawmakers and regulators should, quote, promote an active dialogue between regulators and market participants. The pair of congressmen writing this in an open letter to SEC Chair Gary Gensler and acting CFTC Chair Rostin Benham. According to Bloomberg, Benham has been selected by President Biden to formally lead the CFTC. And Canada-based Bitcoin mining company Bitfarms reporting nearly 400% year-over-year to $36.7 million in the second quarter. It recorded an operating loss of about $2.1 million and a net loss of $3.7 million for the quarter. And finally, as the Taliban takes over Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan, images of Afghans rushing to withdraw money at closed banks are surfacing over the internet. Bitcoiners are wondering out loud if Bitcoin could help. And joining us now to discuss is Jalak Joben, Joben Putra, founder of Future Perfect VC. Welcome to the show, Jalak. So I want to I don't want to get lost in complacency that Bitcoin can fix everything, but do you think if Bitcoin was widely adopted in a country like Afghanistan, the people could have benefited from it and the inaccessibility of money could have been prevented amid war and chaos? Well, the point of uh, Bitcoin is really uh, to, to be self-sovereign money uh, that can cross over borders, that is not dependent on any one government's um, kind of whims or, or their uh, geopolitical uh, 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 views. And, and so, you know, I think without a doubt, Bitcoin uh, can play a role. Um, and and we, we've had um, examples of, of Afghani girls uh, and women uh, being airdropped or or given Bitcoin, um, you know, through several nonprofits over the years previously, uh, where they would each have their own wallet uh, that only they could access, uh, and they would receive micro payments and in, in return for writing blog posts or you know reporting on on the ground situation there. So we've already seen it work. I mean, what happens and what's challenging at a time like this is is, is this mad rush for the banks. The banks are shut down. We've seen it play out in places like. Argentina and India, all, you know, countries all over the world. And it's almost too late at this point. Um, um, but uh, if, if we were able to get everyone to have a wallet uh, that they can access and airdrop and donate Bitcoin to them, at least they have some savings that could be transportable across borders. Yeah, it's interesting you mention women and girls because now the Taliban is telling Sky News that they will guarantee women's rights under the limits of Islam. Now, Malala Yousafzai, I'm, I might be not pronouncing her name, Yousafzai, I don't know, Okay, was shot in the head by the Taliban nearly a decade ago for publicly advocating for education uh, for women and girls. She penned a New York Times essay that was just released today, uh, the titled, I Fear for My Afghan Sisters. And in it, she writes that in the last two decades, millions of Afghan women and girls received an education. Now the future they were promised is dangerously close to slipping away. So deeply alarming what these women with what few glimmers of progress for girls have been made over the years may be crushed because of this takeover. And I'm reminded of uh, Parisa Ahmadi, a high schooler who wrote a uh, was a blogger for the New York Film Annex. She's mentioned in a uh, the first chapter of Michael Casey's novel, Michael Casey, uh, the content uh, head of content at CoinDesk, wherein they he uh, 
explains how she was able to blog for a f film reviews and was able to earn in Bitcoin and using Amazon gift cards that she purchased with Bitcoin, she was able to buy herself a laptop and open an account for herself. So, so indeed, Bitcoin has opened the doors for young women and girls in Afghanistan. Um, just reflecting on on that for a moment, I, you you spoke a bit about it. What what it has done for women and girls in Afghanistan? You mentioned airdrops. Yeah, just um, donations. Um, you know, over over to women uh, that and and whether it's for blog posts as as we mentioned, or uh, to help pay for their education or something that they need that their family can't provide. You know, certainly something I can, if I have their wallet address, can send them some Bitcoin um, and, and, you know, $10 worth, whatever it is, at a very low fee. So, um, so it's a way to get donations uh, directly to the individuals. Uh, it's something protocols can certainly do, different companies around the world, um, crypto companies around the world can do. Um, and the, the challenge really is though, you know, once it reaches there, will they be able to access their 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 own crypto? And, and over the past, you know, uh, 10 years, they, they've had more control and more self-sovereignty. Now it's a big question mark with the Taliban. And, and I, I don't think people know exactly what's going to happen. They certainly have said that they're going to be more open-minded. Uh, they're not going to pull women out of school, but will women be able to be out freely? Will they be able to spend their money? Um, or, you know, will that money have to be given over to uh, mm -hmm. to the males and, and their families? And, and, you know, there's many countries around the world where that still happens. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where having a, a Bitcoin wallet uh, can be really useful is, is if you do leave the country too. Uh, refugees, you know, often um, I come from a family, um, uh, a part of uh, which were refugees from Africa, uh, you know, people try to take gold with them or whatever they have a value with them. Imagine if you, you know, just had your, your Bitcoin wallet, your password, your, your, your private keys, and you know that you'd be okay, that you would be able to access that money anywhere else. And you didn't have to bring like, you know, uh, physical items. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think this is something we need to keep in mind for the future and, and that, uh, you know, Bitcoin is, is not only a store of value for the institutions and large companies and corporate treasuries that we've seen over the last year, but, but fundamentally can help the, uh, kind of help the most, uh, people, people on the ground who are the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And just pivoting slightly, you know, this is the longest conflict in U.S. history, 20 years of war that the United States have been, has been involved with Afghanistan. Tens of thousands of Afghans have died, 2,500 Americans killed, hundreds of thousands wounded, and $2 trillion down the drain. So there is this idea in the Bitcoin community that the United States has overextended itself as an empire. And we heard from Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk last month talking about states are basically like corporations with a monopoly on war and violence, and that a monopoly on money that allows uh, empires to have that power uh, could be diminished with Bitcoin in the sense that it could allow people other alternatives to the dominant reserve currency. And uh, then they, they suggest it could bring about world peace. I wonder what your thoughts are on that line of thinking. Well, like I, I think that is a very kind of Pollyannish view of of, uh, of the world um, that that Bitcoin can bring about world peace. I I, I think there are a lot of human uh, intricacies um, uh, that are going to keep us from from having complete world peace, um, and and that is that just innate desire for power. Um, I have spent a lot of time studying kind of ancient uh, history. Um, you know, looking at the different empires over the years, the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, um, the British Empire. Um, and, and then if you really look at, you know, the last hundred years of American dominance, um, you know, it's, it's not a surprise that we're, we're kind of nearing the end of that. Um, and, and we've seen that happen. I do think uh, a, a self-sovereign currency such as Bitcoin can speed up that process and in terms of, you know, if, if there is 
no uh, one major economic dependency, one country um, uh, that can wield power economically over others, uh, then that creates a more level playing field. Um, and, and so I, I, I definitely do believe that, um, uh, you know, this, this whole kind of industrial war complex that we've seen over, over the hundreds, probably thousands of years, um, uh, is, is not going away, but can be diminished uh, significantly when you start to give individuals on the ground power uh, in the form Mm -hmm. of economic currency where they are no longer, you know, dependent on, you know, fighting for the nation state um, that they uh, can see more of a borderless world work. Well, fascinating conversation, Jack. Thanks you for joining me on that. Appreciate your time. That was Future Perfect VC founder Jack Jobin Putra. Coming up, Bitcoin Price Outlook and financial planning firm Key Advisors Group joins us. The chart of the day is brought to you by Crypto.com, the world's fastest growing crypto app. Welcome back. Bitcoin showing signs of short-term fatigue near $50,000 and is beginning to show signs of profit-taking in the short term, warns eToro analysts. Still, Bitcoin is up about 60% year-to-date thanks to a strong showing by bullish traders throughout the first half of August, which saw prices rise from about $38,000 on August 4th to over $48,000, marked by that white line uh, on Saturday. Low levels of daily trading volume persist despite Bitcoin's rally, while short positions are building, according to data mesh data, pointing toward a return to lower supports near $44,000. UK-based crypto brokerage Global Block saying the trend has flipped bullish, but a pullback is to be expected before continuation because there has been declining volume with an increase in price as well as a bearish divergence in that RSI indicator on the daily time frame you see there circled on the chart in red. All right, joining us now to discuss Bitcoin is Eddie Gabor, co-owner and managing partner at financial planning firm Key Advisors Group. Welcome, Eddie. So would like to get your quick outlook on Bitcoin in the near term as you see it right now. So I agree with basically what you just referred to in regards to what the charts are saying. I do think Bitcoin, now that it's staying well above the 40,000 level, that it's definitely going to be very bullish, in my opinion, for Bitcoin. Uh, But look, with crypto, especially with Bitcoin and the other cryptos is, you know, we expect 10, 20, 30 percent swings is a very common thing. And investors need to understand the volatility aspect of it. Uh, I don't expect a major pullback here. I think it's due for some profit taking due to the run up we've seen in the last few weeks. But I think with this new demographic of investors that are coming into this market and you're looking at corporations continuing to adopt it as a form of payment, I think you're going to see that really expand and more and more people buy into the fact that, again, my opinion is, is Bitcoin's here to stay. I know there's a lot of haters out there in Mm -hmm. regards to crypto, uh, but this is one of the cryptos that's here to stay. And as a long term investor, I mean, I think there is tremendous potential upside here uh, where we are right now. So, Eddie, who are your clients and what are you telling them? What are you advising them when uh, considering Bitcoin in their financial planning? So I think one of the biggest things that investors need to understand when you're buying Bitcoin is the volatility aspect of it. And the other thing, too, and this is not everyone's going to agree with this statement, is it is really correlated to other risk assets in the stock market. I think that's a misconception uh, that it's a non-correlated asset. Uh, So far, when we've seen huge drawdowns in the equity markets, Bitcoin has definitely followed track. And we saw it here recently. Bitcoin was the first risk asset to sell off before we saw small caps and energy companies start to sell off. And now you're seeing that risk asset lead on the upswing while other ones are still staying down. So what we tell clients is 
you know, this is going to be for a speculative investor that has to be able to stomach 20 to 30 percent swings. And if they can't, it's not going to be a suitable investment for them. Um, and I think you're seeing the younger clients really adopt this. They have the longer time horizon, risk tolerance, and they understand it better. Yeah. If you're young, maybe investing now is a good bet. But if you're older and you need the money in the short term, may not be as advisable. I wonder what kind of allocation you're advising. So in regards to allocation, again, uh, you know, this is something that's going to be dependent upon the ultimate risk tolerance of the client. You know, we've seen some individuals uh, have as much as a 15 to 20 percent allocation inside of their strategies. Our client base are a lot of older clients that are retired, that are looking for more conservative strategies. So naturally, that's not going to be a fit for them. Uh, but for their kids and grandkids, we are seeing, again, them really add this as their allocation side. And that part of their asset allocation, they're looking at it as a much longer term buy, uh, understanding that there's going to be lots of swings. But the hope and the goal is that the trend line should be very, very strong to the upside. Mm -hmm. All right, Eddie, appreciate your insights. Thanks for coming on the show. That Thank was you. Key Advisors Group Managing Partner, Eddie Gabor. And that's it for All About Bitcoin. I'm your host, Christine Lee. Join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in New York for First Mover, your first look at the day's global crypto news headlines. You're watching Coindesk TV.